Hello my young friends, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are going to talk about rural development. Under rural development, what we will cover? The concept of rural development, what are the major areas which are covered under rural development, the issues, constraints and also various policy initiatives. Apart from that, what are the various myths that we have about rural areas and rural poor? So this is what is going to be the coverage of our session. We, the proud citizens of country called India, we know that our country is one of the oldest civilizations. Also, our country is rich in natural resources and we've got the best brains in the world. But my dear friends probably would like to know certain hard facts of the country also. Do you know a country which is a home of one billion people has the largest number of poor in the world? The largest number of poor in the world. And apart from largest number of poor, our country has largest illiterates in the world. Number of illiterates in the world. Probably you would be aware that 1 billion illiterates of the world, ours is 300 million. That is larger than the population of US and twice as the population of Brazil and Russia. Apart from poverty and illiteracy, there is another hard fact that is, we have got the world's worst child malnutrition rates. Now, with so many hard facts which our country is struggling and despite the independence that we've got for 60 years, did we really got freedom? Now, certain more things we have to know that 72% of total population live in rural areas and of this 28.5% of the population lives below poverty line and of the rural poor the share of agriculture labor households has increased from 41% in 1993 to 94 to 47% in 99 and 2000. And this is another very, very discouraging fact 
that this poverty is more in various social groups which are marginalized or disadvantages called scheduled caste, scheduled tribes and backward. And this account for 81% of the rural poor as per 1999 and 2000 synthesis. In 2004 and 2005, 28% poor people constituted rural population and this particular incidence was higher among the scheduled caste. That is, it was 36.8%. So now, dear friends, you can understand that where India is the home of largest number of poor, it has got further sectors like social groups, which are marginalized. Among them also, gender issues, females. Females have got larger poverty incidences, the number of population, more than other sectors. Poverty level is not uniform across the country. It is below 10% in states like Delhi, Goa, Punjab, etc. Then it is below 50% in Bihar, that is 43%, and in Orissa, it is 47%. It is 30 to 40% in Northeast states like Assam, Meghalaya, and Tripura, and in Southern states like Tamil Nadu and Uttar Pradesh. As I had discussed with you earlier, the incidences of income poverty among females tend to be marginally higher both in rural and urban areas. The percentage of female person living in poor household was 28% in rural and 26% in urban areas and unfortunately it has rose, risen. It has risen in 1993-94. The rural poverty among the females has risen to 29% in rural area and 23 percent in urban areas in 2004 and 2005. So you understand what are the cons concerns that rural development has. Eventually the concerns of rural development is economic growth because we have seen how poverty is affecting our country. Then we have also seen how various marginalized disadvantaged Social groups are affected more by poverty. So another concern would be, my dear friends, social justice. Then also improvement in the living standard of the poor. And how would we get this? We will get it by providing adequate and quality social service and also minimum basic needs. So the overall concern and the focus of rural development, you can understand is one poverty elevation, second, better livelihood opportunities and third, provision of basic amenities and infrastructure facilities. And for this, rural development launches various innovative schemes to enhance wage and self-employment. Now you must be wondering that when we are talking about rural development, what is the role of agriculture? Although the role of agriculture, the share of agriculture in gross domestic product has declined from over half at independence to one fifth currently, yet all of us are aware that agriculture continues to be the predominant sector in terms of employment and livelihood with more than half of India's workforce engaged in this agriculture as its primary occupation. Most of the rural poor depend on rain-fed agriculture and fragile forests for their livelihood. As you can see, these are very difficult areas and also cause the major concern for rural development. Agriculture intensification during the decades 1930s, 1970s and 1980s has given us incidences of reduction in poverty, rural poverty by increased demand for rural labor which in turn raised rural wages and together with declining food prices. Now we are going to discuss what are the recent trends 
and concern. Now recent trends that have raised concern regarding food security, farmers income and poverty are mainly one slow down in growth. You my young friends must have read in newspapers of, or have seen in television the discussion regarding the growth of agriculture GDP which has decelerated to around 2% during 2004 and 2005. And this deceleration was most marked in rain fed areas although it occurred in almost all the states covering all the major subsectors even those like horticulture, livestock, fisheries where this was expected to be high. Then there are widened disparities between irrigated and rain fed areas. Then also there is uneven and slow development of technology. Not only uneven and slow development of technology but also inefficient of inefficient use of technology and input. Then as you are aware we have been talking about climate change, global warming which has given some major concern of degrading natural resource base. Then rapid and widespread decline in groundwater table which is having the very adverse impact on small and marginal farmers. Now because of all these there is an aggravation of social distress. You must have recently read or heard about the farmer suicide. It's an outcome of all these to give rise to such amount of social distress. Now we are going to discuss my dear friends various issues and challenges in rural development. So the first one is we got a weak framework for sustainable water management and irrigation. And why it is? Because the major, major things which are lying under this are we have inequitable allocation of water and second the irrigation infrastructure is deteriorating. Then the second issue and challenge is inadequate access of rural household to land and finance. My dear young students, the land regulations are so stringent that discourage rural investment. Then also because of technology and computerization, the land records have been computerized and they have brought to the light the institutional weaknesses also. Then probably you may be aware that access of rural poor to credit or the financial facility is very poor. India is one country which is one of those rare countries of the world with, us, with such a largest bank network, bank branches. Despite that, the report of World Bank 2005, only 70% of the rural household have got access to any formal banking facility. And out of that, 80% only are the ones who have never got any credit facility. So you can understand that the access of poor to credit facility is very very poor. Then we have got very weak system of natural resource management because there is very conservative approach to forest and that makes it very very ineffective. Then the forest communities, the community who are living in forest, they got very weak resource rights because of which their livelihood opportunities are also very rare. We have discussed that how these natural resources are degraded because of various reasons including climate change and global warming. Another concern and issue and challenge is that weak delivery of basic services in rural areas. As we discussed 60 years of independence, largest banking network, so many schemes, yet we still have not been able to achieve our match intentions because the delivery systems are very weak. 
because of low accountability, bureaucratic approach, lack of rural participation, and also centralized way of planning. So now, the most important thing which emerges, what is the role of rural development? In order to provide the rural people with better prospects of economic development, social justice, what would be necessary? As we have discussed earlier, we have seen earlier during the issues and challenge discussion, there is a need for increased participation of rural population in their own scheme. Not only that, there should be decentralization of planning so that planning is connected with the field realities and also better enforcement of land reforms. And apart from all these things, it is very, very necessary also to enhance credit opportunities to the rural poor. Now, in order to achieve all these things, the Ministry of Rural Development is implementing a number of programs in rural areas through state governments. These programs are categorized into poverty elevation program, employment generation program, rural infrastructure development program, and also provision of basic minimum services. Now, a few of these major programs which are marked, we are going to discuss that. One program which you have heard, might have heard, is Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana. Now, this is completely a centrally sponsored scheme and what does it do? It connects those habitations which have got 500 individuals residing in that by way of weatherproof paved roads. So, it enhances the infrastructure. Then we have got Swarn Jayanti Gram Sarojgar Yojana. It's one of the very popular schemes because it's implemented with a total package. Now, what is this total package? This total package includes the self-empowerment facilities, especially to the women, to the rural women, the poor ones, and also capacity building, providing facilitation and assistance in choosing the economic activity, subsidy, and also various such facilities which will help them to raise their assets and empower themselves. It is based on organizing self-help group. You must have heard this. Self-help groups are those, a group of those poor people, maybe men or women, who have got homogeneous socio-economic needs. And they get gathered together to help each other to come out of any economic crisis. So they have this powerful way to self-empowerment, to help each other and also act as bank when in need. Then another scheme which the ministry is implementing is called as Sampoon Grameen Rozgar Yojana. Now what is this scheme? This scheme aims at increasing the food protection by means of wage employment in the calamities affected rural areas. And this is done after the appraisal by the state government and this appraisal is accepted by the Ministry of Agriculture. Then there is another scheme called Indira Avas Yojana that is rural housing. Why it is done? It is to help rural poor get the benefits of housing schemes. There is yet another scheme which is important that is called as DRDA administration. My dear friends, in district you must have been familiar with the word, word called DRDAs. DRDAs are district rural development agencies. They are the ones who are responsible for implementing rural development scheme at the district level. Now, as we have discussed earlier, because of the low accountability and bureaucratic approach and also centralized planning, many of these very good schemes are also not able to reach to the rural poor. So to do away with this kind of drawback to strengthen the DRDAs to make them more professional, more effective. This scheme is launched in 1st April 1999 and it is based on recommendation of inter-ministerial committee called Shankar committee. What does it do? Under this, 
there has been a separate provision made to meet out the expenses of DRDAs who are ex expected to effectively manage and deliver various rural development schemes. Then you must have heard about Panchayati Raj institutions. These are local governments. As we have discussed, there is a need of rural participation in their own scheme so that they can own the programs which can benefit the most. So, program which are implemented by the government, if they have got ownership, they will be more effective. In order to ensure that and also to see whether the needs and aspirations of local rural poor are reflected in the schemes, it is ensured that PRIs like Panchayati Raj institution should be encouraged for the implementation of the programs. And also, there are sustained efforts are being made to strengthen local government, institutionalized people's participation and empower women through PRIs. And there have been lot of efforts to pursue the delegation of adequate administrative and financial powers to PRIs so that it can help more participation and the effects have been very very encouraging. The results have shown that there have been larger participation of people and more ownership in these schemes when they are launched through PRIs. Then friends there is a popular scheme which you might have heard in newspaper, uh, in television and also read in newspapers called Nerega 2005. It is National Rural Employment Guarantee Act 2005. Usually the programs which are workforce programs, they provide unskilled workers with a short term employment on public works. So they provide income transfer to poor households during those period when they suffer on account of absence of any opportunity of employment. So you understand the importance of it. Now this Narega or the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act 2005 is a step towards right to work as an aspect of fundamental right to live with dignity. Then another scheme is NSAP. It is National Social Assistance Program. You must have seen in rural areas or the friends who have stayed in rural areas, you might have seen those schemes. This is launched on 15th August 1995 and the basic aim of this scheme is to provide social assistance benefit to the rural poor especially in case of old age death of primary breadwinner or the poor woman during maternity. It also provides opportunity to link various poverty elevation schemes for poverty elevation and also provision of basic amenities. Then there is one scheme called Pura, providing urban amenities in rural areas. You know who mooted this scheme? This was mooted by our former president Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam in January 2003. He believed that way of empowering and accelerating rural development is based on an argument that the provision of urban amenities in rural areas would have highly beneficial impact on rural development. Then you must have heard something called as Bharat Nirman. Bharat Nirman is nothing but infrastructure development for the poverty re removal. The government launched a time-bound program under Bharat Nirman in 2005 for implementation for the four-year duration that is 2005 to 2009. Now my dear friends, this Bharat Nirman has got six components. What are these six components? Irrigation, drinking water, electrification, roads, housing and rural connectivity through telephones. Now we have talked about rural development, the concept of poverty, how many percentage of people living under rural areas, what are the major concerns, what are the role, various roles of rural development, Ministry of Agriculture. But it's also important for us to do away certain myths which many of the people are struggling with. Like, it is an accepted fact that the heart of India lives in its villages and we tend to conclude that brand 
products are nowhere near them. But this is a myth only. What is the reality? Reality is simply opposite. Rural general stores are stocking now the branded items. Substantial improvement in purchasing power. Then increasing brand consciousness, changing consumption patterns and rapid spread of communication networks in rural areas has presented a growing potential for the corporate sector. According to one study made by National Council of Applied Economic Research, it has been found that consuming class households in rural areas equals the urban ones. In case if my dear friends feel that poor cannot pay interest rates and that is why it is necessary that their schemes to be subsidized, let you be clear, the reality is opposite. You must have heard the term called microfinance. We have discussed earlier the self-help groups. Self-help groups are the way of microfinance. Now microfinance has been popular all over the world and the experiences have shown that poor are ready to pay high interest rates provided the financial services are given to them at the doorstep uninterrupted and also in a hassle-free manner. Now the other myth which most of us are struggling with is that poor cannot save, poor are unable to save. Let me clear this, the reality is different. The high rate of savings reported by many microfinance institutions have shown that poor can value saving as much as credit. Now if you think that rural market is a homogeneous mass, let me clarify this is a myth. What is the reality? Actually it is a heterogeneous population. Various tiers are present in the rural mass depending on the incomes like big landlords, traders, there are small farmers, marginal farmers, laborers and artisans. State-wise variations in rural demographies are also present. For example, literacy. Kerala has got 90% while Bihar has got 44%. And population below poverty line as we discussed earlier, you remember my friends? Orissa had 48% below poverty line, whereas Punjab only 6%. So these variations are also there. So it's not homogeneous mass, it's pretty heterogeneous. Now there's another myth which many of us struggle with, that is, in the aftermath of urban-rural convergence, rural market will be only an extension of urban markets, as, as many people assume and will eventually embrace the products and brand lifestyles of the urban markets supported by higher disposable incomes, aggressive retail promotion and advertising. Now various empirical studies have shown the reality to be opposite. Rural markets have got their own unique demands on how the product is to be designed and how the brand is positioned and promoted. Greater the strategic attention to these unique demands, more assurance and also greater the chances of product success in the rural market. So we must understand rural market has got its own uniqueness and it's never an extension of urban markets. Then there is another myth. Many of our bankers feel that banking with the poor is a very unattractive, non-viable and a very low profile job option. Maybe many of my young friends like you would like to take up a job, but let me job in banking. Let me tell you certain things. Banking with the rural poor now is a very prestigious option because it is a national agenda of this country. As you have also learned, India has the largest number of poor, so it's the biggest concern of the nation and also prime concern of the world. And you might have heard recently that Muhammad Yunus of Bangladesh have, has got 
the biggest, most prestigious award of the world called Nobel Peace Prize last year only because he was able to demonstrate a viable model of banking with the poor. Mohammed Yunus is the founder of Grameen Bank. Grameen loans money for self-employment to over 4 million poor women in Bangladesh. You cannot get a dollar without a dollar in your hand. In the poor people, nobody gives the first dollar to catch the next dollar. Dr. Yunus designed Grameen to serve people who have no collateral. Five borrowers form a group and guarantee each other's loans. The repayment rate is greater than 98%. More than half of Grameen's members have moved their families out of poverty. We have demonstrated beyond anybody's doubt that it works and is sustainable and it can work in all kinds of cultural and economic situations. Grameen Bank has become a model for hundreds of microfinance programs around the world, serving tens of millions of the world's poorest citizens. Then, many of the people also feel that if you bank with the poor, then it's not viable. You know what is the reality, my dear friends? McKinsey and Company, you must have heard about it, has given a particular study revolution that is, in 20 years, the rural Indian market will be larger than the total consumer markets in countries such as South Korea or Canada today and almost four times the size of today's urban Indian market. The estimated size of the rural market is likely to be US dollar 577 billions. So it is a huge untapped market which is lying at the bottom of the population pyramid. Then many of the people think that poor cannot be trusted with credit. The consumption needs of the poor are so pressing that any loan will fit its way quickly to consumption. What is the reality? The microfinance experiences have shown that high repayment rate of millions of microfinance clients is empirical proof that poor are credit worthy and the repayment rate are very high as high as 90 to 95 percent in case of self-help groups. Then there is another major myth that is credit alone is useless. It has to be packaged with training, marketing technology and other services for micro entrepreneurs. Friends we have discussed one of the major concerns of rural development is unemployment and to do away with this unemployment, there is a lot of need to develop entrepreneurs, especially when it has to be rural poor, there are many micro enterprises which are given focus on. So in this connection, the reality is a little different. The reality is, although programs that package credit with other services may seem to be good and ideal, they require large subsidies and have proven to be largely unsustainable. The minimalist approach used by Grameen Bank. You remember we talked about Muhammad Yunus? So Grameen Bank and many others have shown that clients can use credit in a small amounts to start or improve the profitability of the micro enterprise. Providing marketing and many other areas of service is valid but can be best managed separately. So my dear friends, we have seen during this discussion as to how much important for us to know what is rural development, which is not only the major concern of our country because of certain factors like poverty, malnutrition and Ill illiteracy. It becomes the concern of the world also. We have also seen what are the various elements which are composed of in rural development like social justice better employment opportunities, then involvement of those schemes which will help infrastructure development 
and also basic amenities. We have also discussed what are the various issues and challenges underlying rural development and agriculture development and we have also discussed what are the various myths which we are struggling with in this particular changing world where the reality is completely different. Many of the times, my dear friends, we are not able to get these realities and not alone us. Many of those who are working for rural development because of certain biases. Some of these biases which the very famous author Robert Chambers has discussed, like one of the biases is many of us who are professional in rural development suffer from one bias called a spatial bias. What is a spatial bias? Whenever we go to understand rural development or rural poverty, where do we want to go? Only those areas which are connected with the roadside. We never go to the interiors. And since we never go to interiors, we never get the glimpses of rural poor. You remember we discussed, these rural poor are not staying connected with the roads. They are staying in those remote areas which are not accessible otherwise. They suffer from infra poor infrastructure facilities. So this is special bias never let us understand what is this rural poverty. There is another bias which Robert Chambers discussed is project bias. Many of the time when these professionals were working for rural development, they want to see the glimpses of rural poverty. Where do they go? They go to those areas where some successful project is going on. Now many of the time these projects have got those personnel who are already professional in speaking the language which is never the language of rural poor. And we go there because it's comfortable to us. But we are never able to get the glimpses of those speechless, invisible rural poor who are quite away from the attention of all these project agencies. Then there is another bias which is called as person biased. What is this person bias? Whenever we go to understand rural development in the field, many of the time we the outsiders have a tendency to talk to only those people who are very good in communication. But haven't you seen during our discussion people who are suffering from rural poverty, they are speechless. They are still not free from any kind of depend independence. They are, they are not independent because for the small bread they have to depend on some or other person. So we understand that these speechless people are away from our reach because we are talking to those who are well communicating and articulating. Then another bias which often we suffer from is called as professional bias. What is this professional bias? We professionals, we think we know better than the rural poor and we never want to listen to rural poor. We listen only what we want to listen. And if you have known or seen, many of these professionals when they talk to rural poor, they never allow them to speak. They never encourage them to speak because there is one bias in their mind that they know more than anybody can tell them. Then there is also a bias which is called as diplomatic bias. Many of these big shots who visit rural areas, even when they talk to their people who are posted in rural areas, they never want to condemn them. Whatever good they say, even when they know the realities are different, they would like to be polite rather than straightforward. These are a few biases, my dear friends, which never allow us to actually get the grasp or grip of rural poverty and rural development. But as my young friends, all of you are going to be the 100% future of this country, you would certainly like to get more sensitized about it, work towards it, so that we can live in a better country, better India, which we deserve to be. Thank you.
There are 600,000 villages. Quarters of India's population of 1.2 billion people live in its vast rural expanses. They make just enough to get by. They toil in rice fields. They harvest mangoes and cashews. They ride ox carts over poorly maintained roads to connect their goods to the market. Villages were central to Mahatma Gandhi's vision of a free and prosperous India. Yet today, Indian villagers are struggling to find their place in this country's growing economic prosperity. As India rises, its villages are in danger of being left behind. In village, only we can say I can say people people work hard, work very hard, and uh, uh, mainly it's farming. Agriculture generates just 24 percent of India's economy, yet the majority of its people depend on it to survive. A lack of infrastructure development, a struggling education system, and a growing water shortage are holding rural India back. Vestiges of the caste system still grasp India's villages, locking many into the stratum into which they were born. So what are the consequences of India's struggling rural state? Already an army of young men, failing to see potential advancement at home and inspired by Bollywood fiction, are leading an exodus to India's cities. Many leave the village by the age of 16 to find work and send money home. Some young men get swept up in a Maoist rebel movement, which is gaining a foothold by exploiting the problems of the rural poor. Landless classes like the Adivasi are especially susceptible to this. Like these brickmakers south of Mumbai who must travel to find work, few Adivasi receive a proper education, making rebel recruitment a tempting option. Traditional farmers are suffering too. Since 1997, the Indian government says at least 25,000 men, most in the prime of their lives, have committed suicide. In the rural areas surrounding Mumbai, the latest figures mean a farmer is taking his life every eight minutes. It's a trend connected to changes in India's agricultural policy, ballooning personal debt, and lack of credit to buy new equipment. It's been made worse by a growing water crisis. Privatization of water and population growth have caused water tables to drop as much as 70% in some areas. In some villages, pumps no longer enough, and women must manually draw containers of water from the well for daily use. Forty years ago, a development known as the Green Revolution helped eradicate hunger and famine from India. Now, this country is growing faster than its ability to produce rice and wheat. There is hope. Large corporate agribusinesses are coming up with new ways to connect India's farms with markets. This holds the potential of creating new jobs in rural areas. Several non-governmental agencies are pushing the government to improve infrastructure from roads to internet access. Connecting its rural poor with the benefits of globalization and feeding its growing population are clearly the biggest challenges to India's rise today. How India approaches these challenges will determine where it is headed. I wish, you know, I wish each and every youngster after the education, after their school level, you know, they shouldn't go to the cities. I think maybe one, if it is like the same like this, one day there won't be anybody in the villages.